Welcome to the Archives of Information Technology, where we are capturing the past and inspiring the future. It is Wednesday the 10th of May 2017, and we're in the worshipful company of information technologists in the City of London. And contributing to the archives today is Sir Robin Saxby, who built and ran for many years and then chaired what I would call the jewel in the crown of the European electronics industry. Well, thank you very much for that compliment, Richard. I'm Richard Sharp, a sometime professor, adjunct professor at the University of Southern California and also a long-time journalist. So, Robin, you left university, um, Liverpool, which we'll come back to in a while, and you started work in Rank Bush Murphy. Yes. Now, there are three uh, names from the blast from the past exactly. in the electronics industry. So, so, we go back a bit further. My hobby as a kid was... Uh, Electronics. I got an electrical outfit when I was eight, and uh, I had a radio and TV repair business when I was 13. And so um, I went to Liverpool because it was the centre of rock and roll, and I love music. I used to build valve amplifiers as well. So I've always been a sort of pragmatic, do-it sort of engineer. And having started in uh, TV repair when I was 13, the new up-and-coming thing, as I was graduating in 1968, was colour television. Colour television was not yet out, it was about to happen. And I thought, uh, I, I, my final year essay at Liverpool uh, was colour television receiver theory and practice. And what I remember in particular is the BBC on the milk round offered me a job on the spot. That's because I could talk colour subcarrier frequencies and I had all the buzzwords. And it was a very good salary because in those days it was like a thousand quid and they offered me one thousand. Uh, 100 pounds and the joke is when I joined Rank Bush Murphy they offered me 1,140 pounds 40 pounds more but that wasn't why I did it the, the reason why I turned the BBC down was I thought BBC make programs and really I liked the idea of making products and we made television sets and Rank Bush Murphy was probably the most entrepreneurial electronics company in the UK at the time it was backed by uh, the rank organisation obviously they had Xerox as well and my claim to fame is we designed the UK's first solid state colour television receiver and, and, my, and, and I got involved in a integrated circuit design back in 1968 which is pretty early on and my state of the art chips contain 50 resistors and 50 transistors and if you think today's chips in your mobile phone have got like a billion transistors, the world has changed. So I was a lucky kid to get the opportunity to join a great company. I also, this is another message for the kids who listen to this, um, I got five job offers. Uh, the one that turned me down was Raykel, and I think that's because I, I feel underneath it all I was kind of a pacifist, and they were in weapons, and I don't think they liked me very much. But everybody else offered me a job, and uh, Ranglish Burphy was my first choice. It was in Chiswick. And what was fantastic was... The, the quality of the engineers that I work with and their knowledge. And, and, and again, what I say to university kids is, you know, you can pass your exams, you can do your circuits. It's the practical experience that matters, and in particular, in any high-volume product, it's about judging the tolerances to, not, uh, to make enough products to make enough profit. You can design one product in a lab, which is fine, but high-volume production... Uh, take some other skills and, and and that was my starting point in engineering and what was your title there I was called uh, design engineer the design uh, engineer yeah yeah and, and um, yeah so you can you better keep asking me some questions otherwise I'll just rub it on <laughs> well you moved to Pi how long were you at um, Rank Bush Murphy so I was at Rank Bush Murphy for four years and the reason why I re moved to Pi and this is just me and this shows how wrong you can be at uh, Rangbush Murphy, we were designing colour televisions, we were designing state-of-the-art chips, they were solid, fully solid state and um, what I, uh, one of the things, I, I gave a talk at the Royal Television Society when I was about 25 years old and it was called TV and Chips and it was a joke, it was TV and Microchips and what happened is Motorola Semiconductors who were setting up in the UK they were looking for bright young engineers who would work for them and they offered me a job and, 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 and the reason why I was moving to Pi because after four years of consumer electronics experience I thought it would be good to get professional electronics experience and Pi were working uh, in it was pulse code modulators that's what, what they were PCM receivers and it was digital 
and I thought it'd be good to broaden my experience, to get to a professional company, get a bit more digital. That's why I chose to go to Pi. In the meantime, before I got to Pi, Motorola offered me a job on the spot. And at the time, I said, no, I've decided to go to Pi. That's my engineering career. But they kept talking to me. And that's how eventually, Motorola seduced me back to join them with a company car. That's, that's another bit of history we'll get on to. So, so I was four years with Rank Bush Murphy, and I thought, I want to broaden my experience. I'll go to Pi. And, and the, what, but what I found is I had this theory that professional electronics would be more advanced than consumer electronics. But in fact, the opposite was true, because with Pi, we were using discrete transistors, not integrated circuits. And the important thing, because the end customer was the post office, every, the biggest worry was 25-year lifetime. So you, if you were designing with the latest technology, where's the proof that it will last 25 years? So what I found Pi, and this is why I subsequently joined Motorola, I was only with Pi for about a year. The engineering was good. <coughs> I learned some new skills, met some other nice people, but... Uh, the market wasn't really at the front end of technology and Motorola, just starting in semiconductors, I had a factory in East Kilbride, Scotland, one in Toulouse, France, and one in Munich, Germany, and they were setting up in those days, for the Americans, Europe was the expanding market. Right. Where was Pi? Uh, Pi was in St. Mary Cray, Kent, actually. Right. Uh, so you've gone from Liverpool... To, to Chiswick, to Chiswick, and, and with to my Kent. wife, by the way, so I, I, I met my wife in Liverpool... Um, again, that's another thing I say to the kids. It's always good to have plans, but the, the plans don't always work out. I planned to fall in love at 28 and get married then, but I met my wife much earlier and fell in love and got married at 23. So that worked out. So the other thing is, the plans are good, but have a bit of flexibility. Right. So you did move to Motor Motorola. Yeah, I did move to Motorola. So I had a year with Pi, and th th so here's what happened with Pi. So what I didn't like about Motorola, so I was very much of the engineering fraternity. And Motorola, realistically, the people who were running the co company, they were salespeople and marketing people. They weren't really engineers. They wanted to hire engineers, and they offered me a job to head up their applications laboratory. But they had no equipment, no budget for equipment, no other engineers. And I said, well, if I'm going to set up an engineering lab, I need all this stuff. And they said, what's that? And we kept talking, and, it, and after a year... They kept showing me the good life, and uh, how, because people on the sales and commercial side, certainly in those days and probably still t today, make more money than uh, people who are just working in the labs. And uh, I was newly married to my wife, Patty, from Liverpool. She was a teacher, and we had our first house in Kent. It was the cheapest way to buy, uh, to buy one. And I was commuting to uh, St. Mary Cray in a beaten-up Ford Anglia, which didn't run very well, and we were very poor with our first mortgage. And so Motorola offered me something like a thousand pounds rise and a Ford Cortina 2000 GXL. And I still wasn't sure about joining them. I thought these people are very commercial. Will I really be okay with them? And um, Jim Knott was the guy who hired me and he picked up the phone and he said, what color would you like me to order for your new Cortina, Cortina 2000, uh, 2000 GXL? And I said, white with black upholstery. And then this is how clever Motorola were on the sales and marketing side. They gave me the car two weeks early. I used to play t uh, table tennis with the guys at Pi, including the chief engineer. He was 53, I was 27, and his name was Norman Everson. And he said to me, have they got any more jobs I could do with a car like that? So that, that was when I, the joke is, I went to the dark, dark side. I went to the commercial side, very nervous, uh, but I learned a lot, and actually I was turned out to be quite good at it. And so you established a lab for them? So, no, so here's what happened. So the, the particular job they offered me uh, to start with, I turned it down, so they hired somebody else. And the job they offered me, I was a sales applications engineer. And what, what a sales engineer does, as opposed to a salesman just getting purchase orders and doing things, he goes into the laboratories of his customers who are designing things and helps them design their circuits. So... I would be selling Motorola integrated circuits, but in order to sell them, I would help the engineers who were my customers learn how to use them. And through that process, <coughs> you're doing engineering, but it ends up in large purchase orders. And the, and, the, and the name of the game is you've got Motorola, you've got Texas Instruments, you've got Mullard, you've got all these companies wanting to get their customers to do uh, use their products. And because I, I wasn't a bad engineer and I got on very well with the engineers, so I was selling to people who'd done very similar jobs to my own, 
And what actually happened in Motorola, there was a big recession in 1974, I think, or something like that. And everybody, the business was going down, purchase orders were getting cancelled, companies were going bankrupt. And what happened is I more than doubled my turnover in the worst year ever because all these new products were going into production and we were getting revenue. So, so they promoted me fairly, fairly quickly. And the other thing which was a learning curve for me, I was very nervous of the commercial side of the business. I was probably a bit naive. You know, the buyer's job is to uh, get the lowest price and the salesman's job is to get the highest price and there's a negotiation there. And to start with, I found that quite difficult. I was very comfortable in the engineering labs talking about the bits and bytes and circuits and things, but in the negotiation it all seemed very strange to me and a bit hard, but I learned fairly quickly. And that, that was a big learning curve. And it, it really is, you know, uh, Star Wars is uh, just uh, <coughs> being celebrated the, 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 20, uh, the, the 4th of May is the Star Wars Day, which this, in, this uh, worshipful company, they did a, a, a banquet dinner that I went to and they had a, the pictures of Darth Vader. But the joke is, I felt that going into the sales and commercial side was a bit like going to the dark side, but it's a bit like may the force be with you, and if you carry on doing good engineering and do a fair deal, you'll be all right. So now you've got the technical expertise in electronics, yeah. and you've also got now this experience of, of sales and of helping customers yes. to apply the products yeah. from yes. the company. And, and what I would say more than that with Motorola, which, and, and I think this is also goes to some of my success with ARM, uh, one of the things I say, and today, by the way, I'm involved in eight startups, uh, and I invest and I advise the, the chief executives. I'm also involved with the Royal Academy of Engineering, got a thing called an enterprise hub. And one of the things I learned from Motorola is that customer pull is a thousand more in, times more important than technology push. So if you meet the explicit need of a customer and fit your products to those needs, you'll do very well. If you try and sell something that's not quite right, what usually happens is you'll get into heavy price negotiation and so on. So, so that's one thing I learned. And then the other thing I learned from Motorola was it's the term, it's all about marketing. So marketing is anticipating the need of the customer, probably before the customer knows he has that need, looking at the technical roadmap of your products and how that fits. So what Motor, Motorola was organized in segment marketing. So I was working to start with in the consumer segment. I did change to the computer segment and when I got a promotion later, but but we'd have consumer electronics, we'd have industrial electronics, we'd have automotive electronics, we'd have uh, com uh, computers and so on. So, so basically the segment marketing approach and understanding the way those technology changes are likely to happen over the next 20 year years and being prepared for them. So I would say as well as understanding selling and learning selling skills from Motorola, I learned a lot about marketing, and, 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 and it's a technical marketing, it's what we call strategic, strategic segment marketing, and, and I very much, that's almost got into my psyche as a way of thinking, and, and you know, getting those skills at 27 was quite good. We'd also mix, I would mix with the designers and the production people. Uh, the other bit of Motorola was very much one of teamwork. At, at the time, we used to do management training exercises on the subject of synergy, and synergy was a training they did for the lunar astronauts. The idea of synergy is in a team, you're all good at something, you're all rubbish at something, and in a crisis situation, you want the person who's best to take charge. So synergy is all about uh, learning those skills, and I learned some of those skills from Motorola. I, again, I was 27 years old, they put me, I was in a computer group in Motorola, and we were playing business games, I was only 27, and we had a team and we told the game is synergy, here's what we've got to do, win it. And I remember the boss of Germany, who was about 45, and I was 27, was saying, we'll do this. I said, no, well, it's synergy, let's everybody have a word. And um, he said, Mr. Saxby, I've learnt a lot from you. The thing is, we won the game. And, and it was, the game, the prize, by the way, was an abacus, as, as we talk about computers. And I've still got it. Um, and Motorola was a company which was, among other American companies, renowned for its training, wasn't it? It was fantastic. I mean, so what was great about it, having worked for the other companies before uh, and after Motorola, it was non-ageist, it was about quality of people, teams, and getting the best out of the best. Um, and therefore training was, was, was very important. And it was, uh, this is also where I learned a lot about Europe. So headquarters of Motorola was Geneva, uh, 
and I'd go to Toulouse and Munich and East Cool Bride, and you'd get different skills and different ideas from different places, but we were very much operating, uh, looking at the whole of Europe, uh, for the opportunities and working together and, and the training was excellent also you know we get things like finance training and so I would I would uh, I was trained in all the business skills as well and you left Motorola why did you leave so it's like everything so the joke is in the performance appraisal um, I was there 11 years which, which Motorola was it was Motorola renowned for yeah yeah it was it was it was Motorola semiconductors was the division I was in and I said to my boss, you know, in the performance appraisal, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to run the whole company. He said, he said you won't be able to. Your name isn't Galvin. Because everybody, you know, you had to be a son of Bob or whatever. And the grandson eventually took over. But So it was obvious to me that, um, to progr- having learnt a lot, if I wanted to get on with my life, I wanted to be chief executive, I really had to leave the company. And what actually happened, it was a headhunting phone call when Henderson were on, on, the, on the phone, it was the headhunter Hydrogen Struggles, I think, they rang and said, we're looking for a chief executive. Henderson, it was Henderson Garage Doors, um, who'd made mecha- uh, mechanical garage doors. They were the UK market leader, 70% market share. And they bought a company called Pitt Security Gates, which was sliding trackless gates. But then they bought a company on Long Island, New York, called Continental Instrument Corporation that was into access control. So they got themselves accidentally into electronics and they had a few problems. And basically the American equipment wasn't working properly in the UK. So my interview was, we got these problems. How do we fix them? What would you do? I said, I'd get a consultant in. They said, do you mean PA consulting? I said, no, I think Dave Leeper could do that in an afternoon. So. I was the chief executive of Henderson. My first CEO's role, we're making security equipment, access control. Uh, we also bought a, a closed circuit television camera company. And it was a kind of entrepreneurial acquisition spree. But, and here's the problem, this is something else I'd say to the kids. My boss, who was a mechanical engineer, was culturally very different to myself. And although I say my Henderson job was like a hard... Harvard Business Practical with a Vengeance. Culturally, he was the complete opposite of me. I was very much a team player. He was very much look at the P&L, look at the balance sheet, look at the cash, look at the detail, and beat the people up. And so having had my sort of difficult period, um, I moved on to European silicon structures. Right. And where did you work there? Where was that So, So what happened is, so this is the other true story. So when I joined... Henderson for the CEO's role, and I wanted to learn the CEO skills. Um, Motorola tried to persuade me to stay, and they offered me several, you know, offers to come back as well. I stayed friendly with them, and they said, "The semiconductor industry is in your blood. You know, you'll be back," sort of thing. And what happened is, I'm at Henderson. I'm the chief executive, not really getting on well with my boss, uh, learning some new skills. Uh, how to be a bully is a good skill to have if you need it, and uh, and how to be difficult. Um, and, and my wife would joke about my old boss if I'm being a bit naughty she'd use his name at me today so I've learned a bit of the real dark side from him which can be useful if I saw him today I, you know, I had to be tough, I had to be difficult he taught me some of that and I said why um, so I got a phone call from a guy I'd worked with at Motorola his name was Jean-Luc Le Grand Clement and he said we're starting European Silicon Structures you probably know Rob Wilmot who's another computer guy was involved at the start of that so this was Europeans uh, Europe's first funded semiconductor company to do full custom ASIC chips and the job I was offered they said we'd like you to come and be the marketing director of the UK first but we want you to be the CEO of the UK because the guy who is the CEO he's going to do something else blah 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 so that's what happened so I joined European Silicon Structures what was fantastic about European Silicon Structures raised a hundred million dollars of, of seed capital which was pretty good we got that from Philips, Saab uh, Olivetti, etc., top European companies, and the idea was we can make full custom silicon more cost effectively than using photomass. And the idea was design, you know, design your own chips direct right on silicon with e beam machines and so on. And it was a fantastic vision, fantastic team of people, fantastic fundraising. The only trouble is the e beam machine, which was the machine to write the chips, didn't work properly. It had a tenth of the throughput of what it was supposed to do. Uh, and therefore the, the P&L didn't work and the whole business model was broken. Eventually they, the company was taken over by Atmel after I left and they got out of e and so on. So it was ahead of its time, but we, 
we and one of the other things I say to the kids: be prepared to make a mistake and have a go. And you, can, you know, job security is how easily can you get another job? And we all learn by mistakes, not by sitting in a room, not worrying about things. So, so I learned a lot about startups from ES2. And if only the EB machine had worked, maybe I'd have stayed there, and maybe ES2 would have been a fantastic success. And and I did get promoted in ES2. I became a vice president. I was part of the European management team, and also with the ES2. I was put in charge of the U.S. company, which was European, Silicon, uh, sorry, United Silicon Structures, U.S. Two, and my last job before I joined uh, Arm uh, was sorting out the U.S. operation in California, in Silicon Valley. So, so ES Two gave me ex- so Motorola gave me exposure, exposure to America and to Europe. ES Two gave me exposure to Japan. We had partners in Japan, and gave me exposure to Silicon Valley. And so one of the reasons why you know, people say, how, how come you were successful? And I said, well, it's my global experience. I'd seen everything, done everything, knew everybody, kind of right place at right time, and it worked. And I think if you, to have, ex- and, and it's re- experiencing the downside of all these things as well. It's not like a glorious success everywhere. It's how to survive and pick yourself up. And the phone rang again in 1991. Phone, phone rang again, yeah. So it was... Hi, this was Hydrogen Struggles. I realised that the headhunter for Henderson wasn't Hydrogen Struggles, it was somebody else, I can't remember. It was Hydrogen Struggles, who, by the way, also hired John Skelly to Apple. Um, they rang me up and said, Acorn were thinking of spinning out the 12-man design team into a new company. Apple were thinking of investing. VLSI were thinking of investing. But Apple wouldn't put the money on the table unless they'd found a chief executive. And I, I was a name, so I went and had a chat. And my chat was, how are we going to make this company work? And one of the jokes is I said, we'll make chips over my dead body. And one of the other jokes is, I'm still alive, and ARM doesn't make chips. But, um, so, my, my, so looking at what Acorn had, they had a great start, but they had no patents, no design tools, uh, only one f- company manufacturing uh, chips for them. But what I did, and I have the correspondence now... Um, I first met them in about August uh, 1990. The company was legally created in November. And the other joke is, if you actually look at the records, I was always uh, chairman, CEO, president and everything, because it was 12 engineers and me to start with. And what actually happened is I stopped being CEO at a point and just carried on being chairman. But the other key thing is a bit of confusion. I was actually with the company before it started doing uh, email, but I couldn't join them because I was on six months' notice at ES2. So I joined ARM um, full-time in February 91, and we did a deal with ES2, actually, because we stayed friendly with them, and they licensed the ARM technology, where I could do days for uh, ARM when I wasn't there, and I'd do, do them back. So we, tra- we traded days. So we, we carried on with a friendly relationship between the two campaigns. And what was the idea behind ARM? So, well, well the ARM was, and this... this so I said, the, well, they said, you know, the business plan said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have the best risk chips, right? And, and realistically... And risk means what? To risk you? means reduced instruction set computing. So what a- why Acorn were using, the, the key benefit of risk was better performance, okay? So it's a bit like um, cars, you know, big engines produce more power. R- the original risk chips from the likes of IBM produce more power. Uh, in terms of performance. Where Acorn were different, they designed the first wrist chip to a cost budget, so the, the ARM1 was the first wrist chip to be designed to a cost budget. And, the, and what, that, what they did have is a pretty fast chip that was at, at a low cost, made by VLSI technology to use in their Acorn Archimedes computers, but the, what, when, when I analysed it with the engineers, we realised the big benefit was the lower power consumption. Another big benefit was the low cost. <coughs> and the first company brochure I did, I said, we're going to be the best MIPS per watt. That's millions of instructions per second per watt. And the best MIPS per dollar, millions of instructions per second per dollar. But we better have some design tools. The only way you could program an ARM in those days was if you had a, an Acorn Archimedes computer. So I thought we'd better port some software tools to an IBM PC. And then the other thing is we had no patents. We'd better en- uh, invent some new stuff. And one of the key inventions is a joke. It was Thumb. Thumb is a 16-bit implementation of the 32-bit arm, which goes on the end of the arm. And the advantage of Thumb was 
it's much lower cost, it's got a, a lower memory footprint, and what that did is it changed a conventional risk chip into something that could compete with all the high volume Japanese, Americans, etc. SIS chips, SIS being complex instruction set computing. So we changed the architecture, and Thermo, I think, is the most important invention. That was done by a guy called Dave Jagger, who's a Kiwi, who happens to have the same birthday as me. Uh, and that's why the ARM architecture got into all the high volume stuff, whereas the MIPS architecture and all the other ones didn't make it. We switched, we, we made the technology fit with the market need of high volume production. One of your first customers was indeed Apple. It was. For they, the Newton, yes, which exactly. was a complete failure. Exactly. You yeah. must have thought, what am I doing here? No, I didn't think that at all. Oh. So, so how I looked at it was Newton's... So it comes by, if you're making mistakes, uh, you're learning. So what was great about uh, Apple, the guy who was behind the Newton project is a guy called Larry Tesla. He had been Apple's chief scientist. He'd also been involved in the design of... Lisa, and he's still a very good friend of mine. So Larry was fantastic. The Newton project was broken, okay, but the Newton really turned into the iPhone. So some of the engineers who had worked on the Newton, and this is what I, I'd say to all the startups, don't expect the first product to work. Expect it to be a failure. Plan for the next one. And so all the first... I mean, it was tough because the, the problem was we might have gone bankrupt, we had no royalties, we were struggling to stay alive, we were running a very lean ship. But uh, we survived and that was, a, that was a journey, that was a step, so the, the Newton was a failure. The other first product that was a failure was the 3DO multiplayer, which was a games player, that was another failure. And the first successful products actually were those dial-up modems that go That actually was the first product with an arm in it to take off in volume and then the really successful product that made the headlines was the Nokia 6110 and we particularly designed the thumb architecture to meet the needs of Nokia. When they looked at ARM they said we love the MITS roll, we love the MITS we love the performance but your code density is rubbish. We said well we can fix that with thumb and what that, it, it, code density being rubbish in the chip your memory footprint would be too expensive but the phone would be too expensive so that's what we had to fix for Nokia. And then another major success was Sharp. We, 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 the idea, of, again, this is very much my sort of thinking, was having worked in the semiconductor industry, my idea was to get lots of semiconductor partners, all targeting different end customers, so we could be globally successful. So it was uh, Plessy and VLSI who got us into Apple to start with, with the Newton, which was a failure. It was Sharp who got us into Nintendo for the Game Boy Advance, it was a color Game Boy. It was Texas Instruments who got us into Nokia. It was LSI Logic got, who got us into the the, the the disc industry and so on. So, that, so there were lots of failures and lots of success stories. And they, again, so the, the Game Boy Advance was going to be a big design win and we got a phone call saying they've canceled the project. And the reason why they canceled the project was they couldn't, the color display, the color display which was also made by Sharp, by Sharp wasn't good enough, so the project was canceled. But two years later, it was back on again. So the challenge with ARM was when do the royalties come? When do we ever get this volume? But what we did, we had to keep licensing stuff to lots of different people and sell design consulting to keep the lights on, to keep things going. And from a licensing point of view, the big win really was, was Samsung. So we got Texas Instruments, we got VLSI, we got a few big players. But Samsung, as Koreans, didn't really understand microprocessors very well. And I managed to persuade a guy called Dr. Hyung Lee Rowe that if he designed his own chips using ARM processors, he could have much more successful products. And look where Samsung is today. And that was the start of... And, and, they, and, I, and the joke was we hadn't got a lot of money and we hadn't got a lot of people. So I quoted them a large price for their license fee because I said, we need to hire a lot of engineers to support you. And they gave me the purchase order. And more than that, they wired me the cash because I said, unless you give me the cash, I can't afford to hire the engineers. So we got a several million dollar deal from Samsung, and that's when we doubled the size of the company. We went from about 30 people to 60, and it nearly killed us, because uh, all the 30 are doing the work and they're having to train the new 30, and you're having to keep things going. That was the toughest period, actually. And so we've got uh, Robin Saxby, the deal maker now. Well, I've always been the deal maker from the... Uh, I, I, so I, I was very much the deal maker from Motorola, but deal making is not, it's not just about... Um, business and money it's about getting the job done okay and it could you know if you look at a football it's really about teamwork it's about um 
you know, all the papers say, I did the big deal with this big guy. Sorry, it's rubbish. A football team is everybody. It's the training department. It's the backroom staff. So I would say rather than say I'm the deal maker, looking at the team, you're as weak as the weakest link. So where is that weak link and how can you fix it and what can we do about it? And another thing is, which is, which is my culture for armies, I believe in brutal honesty, which means when I'm talking rubbish, tell me and I'll admit it and vice versa. So it's, but, but yes, I did close some deals. But the other thing I did, this is another bit of history, so here we were with this startup company, Acorn are wanting us to design all these chips for them. They're telling me to hire another 25 engineers. I say we can't afford it. It will take as long to develop the deals as it will to design the circuit. So we hired Tim O'Donnell working for us in Silicon Valley uh, as, the, as the deal maker there. We hired Takeo Ishikari in Japan. The guy who actually, I think I did the Samsung deal before we'd hired Sam Kim in Korea. So again, it's very much the team. But yes. Yes, I can help make deals happen, whatever they are. That's this was a difficult concept. period when you were doubling the size of the company quite rapidly. Yes. How did you manage that? Well, one of the things that, we were, again, we were very lucky. Texas Instruments were choosing to close down Bedford. So, so Texas Instruments, a bit like Motorola, <coughs> they had factories in Bedford, they had factories in Nice, and they decided that Nice was going to be a bigger centre and they were going to stop making chips in Bedford. So they were shutting it down. And some of the people in TI Bedford didn't want to move to Nice. And one of the things that worked out really well, we got Warren East, who became, he's now the chief executive of Rolls-Royce, but he was the chief executive of Arm after me. And Warren was one of the people we got from Bedford. We got several people. So when you're doubling the size of the company, it's about finding quality people. That's the challenge. What, again, I'd say to the startups is, don't double the size of the company with people who aren't very good. You've got to have the best, and you've got to maintain your standards. So... So it was long nights, but I mean, again, the other, my family always lived in uh, Buckinghamshire and Arm were based in Cambridge. I shared a house with two young engineers in Cambridge, one of them being this guy, Dave Jagger, who invented the thermal architecture. He says we talked about the circuits in the kitchen, but I can't remember that detail. But um, because I was living in Cambridge, I got nothing better to do than work 24 7. So I was on the phone through the night because we're in real time zone. And I'm 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 working. So, so the reality is, you just have to fight your way through it. And the reality is, everybody works a lot more hours. Yeah, and, and 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 the bigger pressure on the engineers who had to get the circuits to work and train the new engineers. But another thing we had, which again I think is part of our success story, I was very much in favour that we had an employee share option scheme for everybody. And there is a joke. I'm completely non-political, but somebody said, "Is he a socialist?" I said, well, I'm not anything, but I'm just practical. And the idea was, is in the startup, if everybody has share options and they can see the upside, they're going to control the cost, they're going to put the hours in. And so that's another reason for the success. It's the team, really. It's not, it's not an individual. OK, the boss has an important role to play, the same as everybody else, but the guy who's coming up with the patents or the new ideas. Or my PA, Glyn, was, you know, doing the phone calls, sorting things out, just as important as me. So it's very much a team a team effort, a team success story. And the Nokia phone was a big breakthrough. It was, the, it was the big breakthrough. It was a big breakthrough because, well, the good news is we managed to, because I, we run it so mean and lean, I think we're only 21 people at the end of year one, we lost something like £200,000 in year one. We lost something like £40,000 in year two and we made a profit of £400,000 in year three, and this is even before Nokia came along. So, but where, Nokia was like the volume rap, really, and also, because Nokia, Nokia changed the phone industry, and I, and, and I have TI to thank as well, it was, it was Nokia, Texas Instruments and Arm working together that, that really invented the first smartphones, that, 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 that was the start of it, and um, everybody contributed, they, and they all contributed in what they're good at, right? And, and it was a team result, and of course Nokia, when they launched the 6110, they were probably number three in mobile phones to Motorola and Ericsson, they took off. And the particular thing that helped us there was Nokia launched their phone in about 1997, we went public in 1998, and when we listed on NASDAQ and London, and because everybody knew who Nokia was, when we're talking to shareholders, it gave us credibility. So Nokia was important for us in many dimensions, really. But but so was Sharp, so was Samsung, so was everything. But, but in terms of the, the IPO, Nokia was a very valuable friend to have. 
And your business model um, you've kept to, which is we design, we support our business customers, we are not a consumer electronics company. Yeah. So, so what I say is it's important to say I retired from Arm in 2007. I'm still very, and that's 10 years ago, I'm still very friendly with my friends at Arm. And the basic idea was we will create enabling technology. It's not like we're just doing custom design. We, the way, the, 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 the parallel is we design the world's best range of digital engines, right? And they can be fast ones, small ones, low power, low cost, simpler for the internet of things and so on. And we'll, put, we'll do extra bits as well, like graphics and things like this. That could be equivalent to turbochargers. But we won't make chips because, and in my Motorola days, I've three, seen three economic downturns at least. And when, what happens with chips is boom to bust. When the, the, the prices collapse, you lose a lot of money. You have to lay off a lot of people. So, my, so the thinking is whoever can make the highest volume at the best price will get the business. Now, there's lots of people, and it depends what, because now chips are so diverse in automotive electronics, in robotics, in wireless, there's lots of applications. So it needs the specialist volume skills, and that's not what we're good at. But, but we, and I say we, even though I'm not at ARM anymore, ARM still designs the best digital engines. And now, with over 100 billion ARM chips shipped, and 20 billion this year, and still accelerating, everybody's using ARM. So now ARM has become the most popular microprocessor architecture on the planet. And you've probably seen Fujitsu's Exascale supercomputer is going to use ARM. <coughs> and so the business model is still the same, still the same culture, even though the company is recently being bought by SoftBank. I'm still friendly with ARM. And in my startups, by the way, one of them is a company called Blue Wireless. We're doing 60 gig Wi Fi. It's a Bristol startup. Arm has just made a three million pounds investment in it, which I'm very grateful for. And one of the guys who used to work with me is now on the board of Blue Wireless. So, so this innovative partnership thing continues. And uh, if we look at robotics, if we look at the future, the potential for Arm, provided they do a good job, is even greater than it's ever been. And when you support Samsung, yeah. When you support Nokia, yeah. When you support Apple, yeah. You have to have an international organisation. Uh, absolutely. So and really your. Th- Third so, phrase really was to build an international organisation. Uh, there's no question. Uh, you know, I, I, <clears> one of the things I said: you don't create a global success by driving a, a desk in Cambridge. So, employee number fourteen was Tim O'Donnell working out of his basement in Silicon Valley, even though the board were telling me to hire more engineers in Cambridge. And he made a huge contribution to the company by saying, "This is what the customer wants. Listen to that voice of the customer. You need the people." To understand that because of cultural differences as well. So it's not just building an organization with one culture. It's actually, and how we got Tim. So Tim used to work with me at European Silicon Structures. And what happened when he heard I've got this job, he's on the phone saying, hi me, hi me. We've had headhunters. Acorn have found some other candidates that I might hire. I said, well, I'll look at all of them. Anyway, we end up hiring Tim. Takio Ishikawa, my partner, VLSI Technology, who was the first licensee, Cliff Rowe, so we got this really good guy in Japan. He's not getting on well with his boss. He's looking for another job. Would you like to interview him? So again, this is the other thing I say to We can get hung up on uh, business strategies, spreadsheets, transistors, clock speeds. The reality of business is about people. It's about contact. It's who do you trust? Who do you believe in working together? And so, so we created a, an international... Well, we, we, in, we started with an international organization because the seed capital came from Apple in Silicon Valley, we had Larry. We had VLSI Technology in Silicon Valley, that was Cliff Rowe. And the third uh, investor I got was actually uh, Nippon Investment and Finance, which was Daiwa Securities. We needed a bit of money to keep the lights on, and, and that was in Tokyo. So the company's always been global, and I've always been on an airplane, and in my time with Arm, I did two long haul flights every month, right? I'd typically be in Asia, and that's, that's, that's the way it is, because you, you get more from sitting. You can have you can have uh, Skype calls now, but face to face stuff and real discussion is what's important. Did you work with Steve Jobs? I didn't work with him because he, when we started on, he was out. He Skell had fallen out with him. I have met Steve and we've had some chats, but the reality is he. Uh, I chose, you know, the value add from Apple wasn't for me. wasn't going to come from talking to Steve Jobs. I did have a couple of meetings with him, but his skill was in designing the Apple products and doing but I work for, I work with these engineers very closely and I've had you know I've had calls with him and so on but uh, there was one call when I that I did have a chat with him over 
when we did a deal with Intel. So he had he has strong he had strong opinions, right? So we we had a we had a nice chat. But I, I'm not into celebrity limelight. I think I think I think that is overrated in all honesty. You mentioned Intel. Intel are convinced they have to have design and they have to have manufacturing because it's like a clock. They say um, it's tick tock. It's tick tock. I, I, so I think that's a bit unfair on Intel. So my per- I'm, I'm a fan of Intel. So why? What is the strength of Intel? A strength of Intel is probably I don't know if this is still true, but they have very very good advanced manufacturing facilities, and. Uh, Therefore, and they've got all this capital investment, so they want to capitalize on that investment. And for certain products, what you just said is correct. However, it's not correct for everything. So Intel is a today on licensee, and it is having some chips made by Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. So it's not as black and white as the headlines might su- suggest, and it's a lot more complicated. What you have to do is use your skill set in the world we live in today and how the world is going to change tomorrow and it changes very quickly. I did some analysis several years ago of um, um, four semiconductor companies, so to speak. Arm was one of them, Qualcomm was another, Intel was the other, and the Taiwanese semiconductor company was the other. And you can see what I was doing. Exactly. Pure design, design and manufacture, design manufacture and pure manufacturing. And you com- your arm company came out in terms of most of the financial metrics right on top. Yes. Because when you get it right, yes. you, don't necess- you don't have to open up new plants no. when you've got a big new no. order. What you have is a number of exactly. new engineers to support exactly. that customer, and then the money rolls in. Exactly. But in fairness to Qualcomm, although they, the, the financials have not been so good lately, Qualcomm's business model early on was not a lot different from ours. I mean, I, I was involved... You, you remember Qualcomm started with a little bit of software. Doing, I'm trying to think what it was called. It was a, an email client and so on. So I've watched Qual, Qualcomm... Qualcomm has gone bigger and more resourced than ARM and more valuable. But some of the... Because Qualcomm licenses as well and the power of Qualcomm's licensing in places like China and so on is important. So the, of, of the four companies you've mentioned, Qualcomm is closest to ARM. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing is, is at the opposite end of the spectrum, and you know that's the world. The world of semiconductors has changed dramatically because of complexity. It's as simple as that. You can't do everything yourself, and you only, and you can only make money if you do what you're the world's best at. You did an international float of the company, yes, IPO in '98, yes. both yes. in Europe and in yes. the United States. Yes. Why? Yes. So um, one of the things you do when you're about to float the company is you take advice from banks. And it was Morgan Stanley we selected to do our IPO. They recommended the dual flotation. And the reason why they recommended it was this. Valuations in 1998 of technology companies in America that were much higher than in the UK. So they thought we would get a higher valuation on NASDAQ. And then since ARM had Acorn as a shareholder, and Acorn was partially owned by Olivetti and it was also a publicly traded company, there would obviously be European appetite. So it was Morgan Stanley's recommendation to do the dual listing. Um, you know, that was an exciting time because we did tours of most of the European capitals and most of America. That was the first time I went in an executive jet. Uh, the joke was it's very cost effective to do an IPO with an executive jet because we cut two weeks down into three. Um, I, I nearly had a joke about the, a new risk factor in the prospectus that Jonathan, the CFO, liked for executive jets, but that was a joke. And this opens you up now to public scrutiny, yes. to thousands of shareholders, yes. and to a degree of pressure from the outside yes. to really perform. And there were times at which Arm was being heavily criticised yes, for not being particularly open about, but, for instance, an acquisition you made and a profits warning. Well, you can't... So, so here's the issue. So if you're the chief of executive of a pub- public company, you have some problems. So we can take each of those... If you... So, and again, as a licensing company, so you've got a who's who, you've got Texas Instruments, you've got Sharp, you've got Apple, you've got Samsung, you've got Intel. All of your data that you put out is being analysed by everybody. So the issue is how much can you tell the public and how much can you keep secret? And as an IP licensing company, you've got to keep some secrets. So there's a bit of a dichotomy there. I think the other thing I would say is there's a difference between London and Silicon Valley. So uh, no disrespect to London, 
but um, I would say that the criticism sometimes is I'll criticise you to get, get so you give me the information I want to hear. And I would say the UK, certainly at the time of the flotation, 1998, the UK analysts didn't really understand what we were doing and the, and the Americans understood it better. So we would get different criticism. Very di the, the press criticism in the US would be very different from the UK. So that's point one. Uh, point number two, over the acquisition. This is one of one, a, a tough thing. So here's the deal. We are buying a company, Artisan, which is a public company in America and it could be blocked by antitrust. So I am being advised by lawyers what I can and can't tell my shareholders. And uh, I would have liked to have told the shareholders more. And I, the day you know, the day the artisan acquisition came out, announcement came out, the share price fell 20%. And they asked me lots of questions and I said, I can't tell you because we could have been blocked from that acquisition. If I, so I was being driven by the lawyers. And so, sorry, Shell, I can't tell you, mate. Good news, by the time the actual acquisition went through, the share price was by where it was. You know, that, that's, that's, that's just life. So, um, and then fortunately, on my watch as CEO, we never did a profit warning. My timing was obviously impeccable. Poor old Warren. Uh, when he'd been fairly newly CEO, did his first ever profit warning, and I remember it very well. And the reason for the profit warning was this. So, Arms Business is this, uh, it's, it, at the time, it was more licensing than royalties. It's probably more royalties than licensing now. But what happens is you do these license deals and you get a third of the income <coughs> when you sign the deal, a third of the income when you ship the the, the data to build the chip and a third when the chips work that what happened and so and, and this is cash cash up front for a third of the year so it's revenue recognizable the profit warning was very simple it was a particular quarter that there were two deals and they're worth some millions each that we thought were going to close we, we were told they were going to close right but mr so and so is away and doesn't sign the paperwork so what happens is the the uh, the deal that's supposed to come at the end of I think it was Q1 that was missed or was it Q2 I think it was Q1 the deal was supposed to close in the end of March comes in in late April and you missed your quarter and that's life and I think what's remarkable about Arm it's 26 years old and it's only ever missed one quarter right and 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 I think this is a game where uh, people should be smarter really because Arm had never missed a quarter and because everybody else misses quarters all that time. Arm's the exception. It will never miss a quarter. So of course the minute you miss a quarter, it's a disaster. And that was a good baptism of fire for Warren in his new CEO role. That he says that's the time. But you were chairman end. by now. I was chairman. Yeah. And a particular role for chairman, is it not, is to sweeten up the city. But you can't sweeten up the you, the facts are the facts and the reality and this is what I say to the city don't sweeten up the city. City, get real, right? And and if we look at where we now we are now politically, there's a lot of nonsense. The numbers are the numbers. The reality is this is the frequency of the deals. Get real, guys. And I don't believe in sweetening up anybody. I believe in telling them the way it is. And if they don't like it, hard luck. And I remember again when when the arm share price fell, it fell twenty percent. This is the day of the artisan acquisition. I was called into a meeting with my biggest shareholder and there were two people there and one of them hated me, abused me, said all, all sorts of nasty things at me and I just sat there and smiled and I explained to the other guy why it had happened, this is over the artisan thing and he believed me. The guy who um, didn't believe me sold his shares and lost quite a bit of money and the guy who believed me made money. So, Timing is everything, and it's, by the way, it's up to you to form a judgment on me. I'm not perfect, right? I make mistakes. But I don't believe in this sweetening up thing at all. It's nonsense. Absolutely. And that's what's wrong. It's, it's, we need to get rid of that. We need to be trans and, and we need to be more transparent. But unfortunately, <coughs> the world isn't, you know, you've got hedge funds and you've got trading and you've got all sorts of things. So the world isn't as transparent or as fair or as reasonable as it should be. Uh, the joke is with the transistors, they don't lie to you. What's on the oscilloscope is real. And with human beings, you have to make a judgment call. And in all the startups I'm involved in to now, now I, my job is to advise. And I say to them, you can listen to my advice, you can accept my advice, and you can reject my advice. It's absolutely fine. I'm just here to advise you. And as the chairman, 
It's your job to communicate as effectively as you can, and I think we managed to do that. But it's never perfect, right? It's like like football teams. Occasionally, they lose a game. So you were ten years as CEO, yeah, and you helped build a company into a ten billion dollar operation. Yeah, value of value. I don't mean yeah. turnover. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean yeah, real yeah. value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. No, yeah. no ego, just value. Well, it's ten okay, but, but but what's value? You know. It's whatever people will pay for it. Yeah, yeah, but 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 the more important thing. So so that's nice, but let me tell you something that makes me feel better. When I went and saw some poor people in Morocco with their arm-based mobile phones, doing e-commerce on their mobile phones and improving their quality of lives, uh, or, or or somebody who's unhealthy and keeping them alive, that makes me feel a lot better than it's worth ten billion. What's money, you know? You don't, you don't take it away with you. So it's nice, it's a nice label, but to me, <coughs> it's, it's health, happiness, satisfaction, fun, freedom. These are all the, all the important things in life. And as they say, you know, money doesn't buy you love. Uh, it, money, having enough money is, is, is help. But, but, but I'm not, uh, and this is, I think this is the other difference. I am involved in startups and venture capital, but I'm much more interested <coughs> in the innovation and the new technology than I am in making the money. The money is a useful byproduct. You deserve to earn something for your money. So, yes, it's nice. And I mean, I look at SoftBank today. So SoftBank are buying ARM. It's 30 billion. And I don't know if you've seen, but SoftBank have sold 25% of ARM to the Saudi fund as a currency to move it on. So the good news is that money is going to go into other startups and all the rest of it. But the numbers are just the numbers, you know. If you're worth a few bob, what's a few more bob? You can't spend it. And you left uh, just about a decade ago exactly. from ARM. It's yeah. still in, in your heart. Yeah, yeah, I'm still... What so did you feel with the sale to SoftBank? So my, my This is a Japanese company. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I love the Japanese, first of all. So I personally, culturally, if you look at the licensees who contributed most to ARM in its early phases were all Japanese. Toshiba, Sharp, Sony... Uh, Hitachi, uh, NEC, and so on. And I spent a lot of time in Japan. When we did the deal with Nintendo and Sharp, I personally went to Japan 10 months out of 12, and I loved the cherry blossom season, and the Geiko, and the Mako, and the mountains, and the trees, and the skiing, and all the rest of it. So I love Japan culture, and I love the Japanese. So, from my point of view, this is how I look at it. Arm has been a private company for eight years, okay? backed by Acorn, Apple, VLSI, American, two Americans, one British, and Nippon Investment and Finance, a Daiwa securities company in Japan. So it's been global. We happen to float the company on NASDAQ in London. The shareholding of ARM, uh, on, you know, while it's a public company, 60% of the shareholding is outside of the UK, and 99% of ARM's customers are outside of the UK. And by now, Arm's got a thousand people in Bangalore, so the, the global globalization of the company's got even greater. You've got design centers everywhere, and me personally, this is what I do in my startup world. I'm traveling around all these design centers. I mean, I, I find Bangalore a fascinating place. The pace of change there. Look at how Shanghai has changed. So, so to me personally, clearly, it's nice that Arm is a very successful FTSE 100 company listed on the London Stock Exchange, everybody makes money out of that, it's great. It's a nice label. However, who owns the company, um, to me, is kind of irrelevant. And, 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 and provided the culture of Miyashi-san and Simon Seegers, who's the CEO, remains good, the chances are that this acquisition, I'm always an optimist, can actually make things better. And I'll just give you the example. The direct investment in Blue Wireless, this 60 gig Wi-Fi company that I'm involved in, SoftBank was as keen on that as ARM were because as they're a mobile operator with wireless, they want to get more into the technology with ARM. So, so what I said you know, on the day of the announcement was, it's too early to tell whether it's good or bad. It's either going to be great or it's going to be terrible. Probably one of those two because ARM is all about the quality of the engineers and the people and if you lose them, you've lost everything, right? So. But what's happened, because I, I keep in touch, again, through the startups and so on, what's happened is some people have been promoted, some people have made quite a few bob and decided to retire early, and, but they've put that money into new startups. So at the moment, 
uh, it's okay, okay, and I still keep in touch, and I, I have dinners with people, I'm, I'll see some people tonight, so I'll say, how's it going this week, you know, and the, what I would say is there is a change for the people, because it was, in inverted commas, our company, if you like, now, yeah, I think Herman Hauser called it a bit of a disaster, didn't he? Well, he did, but the other thing I said about Herman, and you might not believe this, but Herman never worked for Arm. Has never had anything to do with Arm. He was equal. So he, I, and he lives in Cambridge, so I think his view is more narrow than my own. And for him personally, yeah, of course you'd prefer it if it was still there, it was still independent, of course. But you can't change the past, and if you talk to Herman now, He's because he's still a friend of mine. He's more positive, and he says, "Yes, I can see some good things are coming out of it." And again, in the history of life, I mean, I'll just tell you something. When when I signed the Texas Instruments, I got crucified for doing that by VSI, who were my partner. They they were really cross with me, and the reason was they were in a lawsuit with TI over packaging uh, patents on packaging, and and they kind of they kind of fell out. And then a year later, they said. Doing that TI deal was the best deal that ever happened. Um, and what I'd say is, I'm not saying that that uh, the SoftBank deal is too early to tell how good it is. Let's judge it in five years' time. But it's not a disaster, and it looks all right, and it might be very good. And let's give it time. In the last ten years, you have been supporting and developing a number of um, ventures and mentoring yep. young engineers. Yep male and female, yeah. and seem to be thoroughly enjoying it. I do, I love it. What three things would you say to young engineers today in the current condition of the industry? What should they be doing? How should they do it? So the first thing I say to the, the kids, the, there's, there's, there's two sides of being a human being. There's the logical side, and there's the emotional side, right? And what I also say when it comes to hiring people, you want to hire people with a high logical intelligence and the high emotional intelligence. You're, you need an equal dose of both because the emotional side is about communication, passion, all these things. So the first things I say to the kids are, what do you really love doing? What makes you really, really happy? And my interview question is, what's your biggest achievement? I usually start there. And then I usually go, what's your biggest failure? So my starting point to the kids, do an honest evaluation of yourself. What do you love? What do you hate? What's your biggest success? What's your biggest f failure? And kind of write that down on a single piece of paper. Because you, some kids, they just do what mummy and daddy tell them to do, right? Other kids, like me, I had my radio and TV repair business, so I've always done what I want to do, right? Help, help my, my parents. But not everybody knows what they want to do. But do some serious analysis first on a, a piece of paper. Then the second thing is, where would you like to be in 20 years time so so one of the dangers in life oh, we have got to pay the rent I've got to get a mortgage I've, you've, you've got all these problems have a bit of a dream so I said you know without, we're going to be the global risk standard everybody thought I was mad Warren will say you know he thought I was bonkers he actually said that in the speech but I kept saying it I kept saying it and we did it so you've got to you've got to dream you've got to think beyond the possible and back off to reality and then the other piece is I really believe in SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, and be very honest about that. And then the other thing to the kids, which is very, very important, surround yourselves with people you trust, and if you love them as well so much, the better, but basically, don't just be an isolationist, so it's about people, it's about teams, and this is the other bit, it's think a bit about what you are culturally, so, you know, and hobbies, so, so if you like playing tennis and you mix with tennis players, you'll feel, and they happen to be engineers, or you like to go skiing. So, so think about some of those things and write it down. And then what I'd say to them is, write down your one-year plan. And for your one-year plan, write a monthly report. Achievements, problems, plans, and just keep looking at it and just keep going back and, and keep adjusting it. And it's fine to break the plan, but and, and I do believe in a one-year plan. That's the short term. It's the p and it's, it, it's the annual plan for a company. I believe in... A strategic plan, which is the 10, 20 years out. How are we trying to change the world? What are we trying to do differently? And then I believe in the tactical plan, which is the things we have to do today to hit, hit the strategic plan. So in, in ARM's early days, it cost us money to buy patents, right? Hurt the P&L. But if we didn't have any patents, we'd be dead. We had to develop the tool chain on the IBM PC. Cost us money, no revenue. So those are the tactical things that you have to do today that hurt the P&L. 
and then what are the things we can't do? Don't waste money. Don't waste money, right? Cash is king would be the other message. And the other thing I say to the kids, you can do anything you want. Just work out what it is you want to do. And then the other thing you might do, find some older people like me who've made all the mistakes and have a chat with them so that you don't make the same mistakes that we've made. Thank you, Sir Robin Saxby. We're back at the Archives of Information Technology with Sir Robin Saxby, and he's going to talk about his early life. You were born in 1947 in Derbyshire, in Chesterfield. Yes. And what did your parents do? So my parents were just ordinary working people. My dad uh, worked in a hardware factory and, and, and things like this, and he actually was a security officer, was his last job. Uh, my mum was a housewife. In those, the, the way I was brought up, the mum looked after the kids and the dad went to work. And the other thing about my dad... He had his male life, which was to go down the pub, Queen's Park Hotel, and play nine-card brag with his friends. And as I got, as once I was old enough to drink, I could join my dad and play nine-card brag. And uh, you went to a primary school. What did you actually get from your parents that makes Robin Saxby? So they were very supportive, very loving, very caring. My dad was more the sportsman, so he threw hard balls at me and I had to catch them, you know. So he toughened me up with his cricket, and he was a good footballer as well, my, and tennis. My mum and dad met, uh, they actually won the tennis championship, so I, I love tennis, so I got that from them. My mum was really the supportive, almost anything I did was okay, and she would support me, right? And so she was the supporting mum. My dad, with my radio and TV repair business at 13, my dad got the purchase orders from his mates in the pub, and my mum acted as the technician and held, held the, held the uh, chassis where I was, I was solving. So they are a warm uh, family. The other thing is they were both one of seven. They were the youngest of seven. So I had a lot of aunties and uncles and um, grandparents and so on. So I was in a, a warm, loving family that didn't have much money, uh, but were very fair and very kind. Um, it's a relatively unusual name, and the only Saxby I came up with um, was the people who make the pies. Yes. Any relationship? So, so probably distantly. I, I've done family history because um, my dad's dad died when he was only three, and so I wanted to know about his um, side of the family. So, my dad's dad, he was a colliery surveyor in mining in Derbyshire, Bolsover Colliery, but he came down from the Durham coal fields, and his dad, it turns out, was a, William Alfred Saxby, was a master mariner who was born in Essex and, and brought coal from Durham to to London on his own sailing ship. I know quite a lot about him because I found the records. And his dad was a publican in Kent. So the Saxby origin is actually Kent and they reckon it comes from Saxe-Coburg in Germany. That's and oh I've done I've done 23 and me and the DNA and um, I've got I, I've got I've got German blood, Viking blood and French blood. So I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not I'm not too much uh, British and Irish. A bit of a bit of Irish in me. And you passed your 11 plus and went to Chesterfield Grammar School. How was that for it, you? It, it turned out to be great. It was a, it was, I was very fortunate. The grammar schools were fantastic because they were structured on public school lines, discipline, sport, uh, debating societies, uh, art, everything. And that really helped me, not just in passing my A-levels to go to university, but the school societies. I, I was deputy secretary of the Senior Literary and Debating Society, and I had to debate alongside Stephen Wakelam, who was the secretary, and he went on to be a great playwright. So what, what the school gave me is putting me with the best of the best. And probably uh, the school motto was known quo sed quo modo, not what but how, and I think that's very true. I've actually written a song, known quo sed quo modo. It's not what we do, but how we do it, how we apply ourselves. And I think that's another message to kids. Think about the how at least as much as about the what. You moved to the University of Liverpool, you applied and you got in. Yeah, yeah, that was my first choice, I was very happy to go there. I picked it because it was on the coast, and it was a city, and it was a swinging city, the Beatles music, I've always loved music. Uh, again, in my electrical career, I used to build valve amplifiers and, and, uh, f f for the rock and roll clubs in Chesterfield, and like, again, when my son studied, um, I did valve amplifiers for his guitar. So, uh, I went to Liverpool, loved it. Liverpool is probably my 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 favourite city in the world. The scouse wit and humour is fantastic, um, and we're still supporters of Liverpool Football Club. Had to do that because my wife said I had to become a Liverpool supporter. She wasn't too impressed when I took her to see a game at Chesterfield at Saltergate. What is the um, Saxby style of management? 
it's a we not me it's a teamwork it's a let's be brutally honest with each other and let's get some facts on the table and there are no rules it's like every opinion counts let's kind of whiteboard and brainstorm let's look at all the extreme positions on everything and uh, then let's work it out you seem to be brutally honest sometimes. That must have got I, you into trouble. I, it has. It has. Uh, a lot. So I was told at Motorola that uh, being brutally honest when I told the chief executive that our quality wasn't good enough and explained why, uh, my, a, a boss told me that I would have had a promotion three years earlier if I hadn't told him that. Uh, when I had a boss at Henderson, uh, he said in that meeting with Norman, you admitted you mis made a mistake. Uh, sorry, meeting with Stuart, you admitted you made a mistake, never let me hear you say that again, it's a side of weakness. At the time I believed him, but I realised he was a bully, and actually admitting your mistakes is a good idea. So the good news about being brutally honest is if you, if you don't offend the other person, or if you do offend them and you say you're sorry, you can move to faster communication and you can get things done uh, quicker. And then the other thing I would say is brutal honesty. You have to I live in a culture and a, a world of engineers. I get on well with my son-in-law, he has a degree in computer science, and we start by defining the methodology and the rules under which we're playing. Brutal honesty, you have to define the ground rules as to what that honesty means, because what, what looks good to one environment doesn't look good to another. So respect the other person, and as I get older and I have more time to look at other people and other ideas, I realise even more there's a lot of things I don't understand and I don't know and my wife understands better. For example, she was a teacher, she's more looking for the weakest link and helping the weak along. As a chief executive you hire the best and you find the not so good ones. That's, it's a different world. What drives you now because you don't have to do all the things you're doing? I just love being alive and um, I, I, love, I love new things, I love new challenges. I, um, and I'm very, I'm fortunate, you know, I'm fit, I'm healthy, uh, and I love the startups. So I'm involved with eight startups. I'm involved with the Royal Academy of Engineering, past president of the Institution of Engineering and Technology, uh, fellow of the Royal Society. So the benefit of all of these organizations and startups is young people can connect to older people, young people have engineer, uh, energy, ideas, they're in the new world, you know the millennials, the internet's been around all their life. Benefit of older age, you have more experience, you've made more mistakes, you can share ideas and you can hopefully get a better result. You were knighted in 2002. I think so, it might have even been 2001, but I'm not sure. What does that knighthood give you apart from get you a table in a restaurant that's already full? Well, I don't know if that's true. Um, and British Airways will probably lose your luggage if they find out on purpose, but uh, no, it's a joke. Um, when you get the letter saying you've been offered it, you've got, you've got to make a decision, yes or no. And me being me, I said to my wife, should I accept this or not? I'll need to sleep on it. And the reason why I didn't want to accept it necessarily was I don't want to just get something I haven't earned. And talking to my wife, she said, your mum would be very pleased uh, to have had a night. And uh, there aren't many technologists who've got knighted, so you might be able to do something useful for your community. So it's a lovely ceremony. It's a label. And I, I'm very much call me Robin, but if you don't want to talk to somebody, you can get your PA to say Sir Robin is not available. So it has its advantages, but it's uh, it, it definitely is a door opener. It's good at speeches, but um, and and you know I've met a lot of the royal family. They're, they're very nice. They do a lot of work for charity. So it's just just something to have. But it, to me, I mean, I happen to have a Faraday Medal of the Institution of Engineering and Technology, in all honesty, since I'm a big fan of Michael Faraday, that probably means more to me than the knighthood. What's your biggest mistake that you've made in business? Oh, I've made so many. Um, I, I, I'm just trying to think. I mean, they're all, they're, they're, there's loads. So you, you misjudge your situation, you misjudge your negotiation. I think the biggest mistake, or... The hardest thing to get right all the time is judgment of people. So the classic one is, I've always believed in having uh, succession planning, two, two names in the box, um, and in one case I promoted the wrong person, so that would be one of the bigger mistakes. Uh, in another one I put Warren East became the chief executive of Arm after me, that was the right one. So, so those are the sort of mistakes you make all the time. And if you really believe in a person, you tend to want to support them for longer than you should. You're not, 
you're not brutal or, 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 or tough enough. I mean, I'll just tell you a mistake I made today. Um, I'm going to have a meal with Simon Seegers, the chief executive of Vaughan in California. And I got an email back saying, and I looked at the date and the date was wrong. And I went back and said, oh, we got the wrong date. But actually, when we dig into it, it's the difference in the time zone. And that's the technology for you, see. But I, and I've apologised to Simon's PA for making a mistake. So I'm making mistakes all the time, and that's part of life and part of learning. You, when you're not being showered with awards and honours, and you have been showered with awards I, and honours. I've honors, got quite a few, yeah. You've got quite a few. What do you do? Uh, well, I mean, what I do... So these, these startups, I mean, the Royal, Ant- the Royal Academy of Engineering Enterprise Lab, let me tell you about this. So... I was made a fellow of the Royal Academy some years ago, I can't remember, and uh, that was quite an honour at the time, but now I'm one of the people who's been around. Um, The Royal Academy has been fantastic at PhDs, supporting professors, Nobel Prizes and all the rest of it, but we haven't been very good at wealth creation. So a bunch of us thought it would be a really good idea to create the Royal Academy of Engineering Enterprise Lab. And I personally have put some money into this, a charity, I've also put some money into Liverpool University. There's the Robin Sykesbury Laboratories and there's a management school. So I've given something back. Um, And so what I'm interested in, I think if you're the kids now, it's harder to get money, it's harder to start, it's more difficult. I went to university on a full grant, uh, free education and and so on. Now it's much harder. So Royal Academy of Engineering Enterprise Hub, we've created, I think, 80 startups. And they're all very exciting, all new stuff. And what we do as, as, as fellows is we give them free mentorship, mentoring, like I'm talking to you now, just advice. So one of the things I'm due to do, we're going to have our Enterprise Hub Showcase Day, I think next week, or maybe it's the week after. And then I'm also doing with, I think six of the startups have been selected by the administration side of the business, a lady called Anna. And I am going, they're going to do surgeries with me. And we're going, to, we're going to talk about those. Now, one of them that I met, this is another thing that actually happened, Sam, uh, Sam Cockrell of a company called Libertine that's doing free piston engines. I started off mentoring him and then I said to him, after we'd done a lot of mentoring, I thought, well, this guy's really pretty good and this idea is really pretty good. So I said, Sam, would you like me to write a check out? So I've written a check out and I've just had another email today, one of my startups. So I've got, I've got eight high tech startups that all have the potential to change the world in the same way that Arm did, because I'd like to do it a few more times if we can. And I'm trying to help them with a bit of money and a bit of advice. And I'll, I'll give you a doubt. This is what I'm very excited about. This is a company called Sontia. This has got the best sound technology on the planet. I'm going to demonstrate these headphones to you. We've just announced a licensing agreement with a major Japanese, uh, Chinese partner. And Sontia has people in Sheffield, Silicon Valley, and uh, Shenzhen, China. That's where the, where the people are. But I'm very excited about this. And this even is going to apply to movie theatres. So in the same way that ARM has changed the world of chips, I believe that Sontia technology can get into every loudspeaker, every cinema, every headphone, everywhere. That's, that's my mad dream for Sontia. When you've heard these, you might believe me. Thank you very much, Sir Robin Saxby.